Hello there. Do you know what every software engineer earlier in their careers learned about building software reliability? That to achieve that, all they gotta do is to write good quality code, to implement enough testing, and to use as many proven architecture patterns as possible. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint, but this is not entirely true. If they do all of this, all they gotta do is to achieve software correctness. Software reliability is totally a different thing. In my experience, this is what happens when you put your code in production. That's a true story right there, at least in my experience. I hope none of you can relate, but if you do, well, I bring some good news. There's a way for you to transform all this uncertainty, which is running code in production, into predictability. And the answer to this is maybe using distributed tracing. Distributed tracing is more than a technology, it's a technique that you can use to improve the way you manage, understand, and execute your code in production. And we are going to discuss all of this in this presentation. So here is what we are going to discuss today. First off, I have the challenge of making sure you understand that distributed tracing is not a boring or complicated technology, but instead, it is pretty awesome. Then, I'm going to show you how to use distributed tracing in the context of monitoring and why this is important. Then, we're going to discuss the role of distributed tracing in today's set of technologies. And lastly, we are going to see some of the approaches that you can use to make your observability journey easier. But before we move on, I think it is important for me to introduce myself first. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Ricardo Ferreira and I am a developer advocate at Elastic. At Elastic, I'm part of the community. The community team is known for being the developer relations department of the company. And there, I am responsible for a global strategy focused on observability. Before joining Elastic, I used to work for other vendors as well, such as Confluent, Oracle, and Red Hat. If you want to keep in touch, the best way to do so is to send me a message on Twitter, and if you can, also follow me there. From time to time, you're going to find that I post something that is going to be useful. Now that we have been properly introduced, let me explain what I think distributed tracing is awesome. The way software engineers check if the code is doing what it's supposed to do is by implementing something called unit testing. Unit testing are ways for you to hard code a hypothetical set of scenarios that is going to mimic the flow that users are going to take while dealing with your application. The same set of unit tests are going to be reused throughout the process of moving the code from dev to production. So what is the lesson here? That the only criteria so far being used to make sure that the software will be correct or reliable is based on the unit tests. Don't get me wrong, unit tests are great and you are definitely are supposed to continue using them and implement them as much as often. The problem is, you cannot blindly believe that only by implement unit testing, you are going to make sure that your code is uh, probing all the possible situations that can be uh, present in a production environment. When you deploy your code, you are dealing with a number of moving parts that were not available in the code and dev environment. And that's the reason why you have to make sure that you use not only unit testing, but some other approaches along with your software development life cycle. One of them, as I mentioned before, is using distributed tracing. It is a technique that you can use to make sure that you are going to foresee situations that maybe the unit testing didn't cover. And most likely, this is not going to be hard to find because think about it. How many times you've shipped code that you said everybody that was ready to be used and deployed, and one hour, two hours later, maybe six hours later, there was a customer or 
a set of customers complaining that they were unable to finish their transaction because, oh, maybe some 503 errors start to pop up and uh, keeping them for not using the software properly. So this is the type of thing that happens when you don't test uh, your code enough. And again, unit testing this part of the job, but you also have to make sure that unit, the software is tested not only in dev or Q&A, but properly in production. So your customer got a 503 errors. What happens next? Well, first off, happens something that we call the suspect phase, where you and your development team are going to sit down and trying to replicate and reproduce the problem, right? Maybe you can, maybe sometimes you can. But the reality is that if you can reproduce the problem, the very next step is to try to find where in the application the problem is occurring. And that's what we call the drill down. During the drill down phase, you are going to evaluate all the services, layers, and all the moving parts that comprise your application to see where the problem is occurring. And if you find it, you are going to actually go to the fix phase that you are going to produce some sort of a patch or a code fix, and you are going to build a new release of the software. And hopefully that will fix the problem. But if you think about it, all of this takes a considerable amount of time in the part where you have to find where the problem is occurring. And that's one of the value that you can see by using distributed tracing. By using distributed tracing, you can have the execution of your code capture in a such a way that you can use something called observability backend where you can inspect this execution and very quickly and visually see if there were any problems related to slowness or unavailability. This will work like a picture of the execution of your code. In order for you to actually do this, you have to pick one of the possible instrumentation options available out there. There are two known. The first one is called white box instrumentation. White box instrumentation is when you have to actually open up your code making some changes, actually create some custom code so the code execution can be captured and sent to the observability backend. The other approach is using call, something called black box instrumentation. Black box instrumentation is when you use some sort of an agent that can be executed, either attach it or in conjunction with your code, and no changes are required, even though the execution of the code can be sent to the observability backend. Let's see how this works with a demo. Let's start with an example of microservice written in Go. This microservice here called Hello App has one business transaction called slash hello. Let's take a look on the details of this transaction. As you can see here, all the details regarding the execution of that transaction has been captured and can be visualized with the observability backend. Here in the bottom, you can see the complete end-to-end -end execution of that transaction and all the moving parts that comprises it. It all starts with an entry point called slash hello that represents the start span. Then within the context of that start span, there were two child spans created, one called build response and another one called my span. Let's understand how those spans were created. The first thing you get to notice regarding this code is that there was a middleware registered here to make sure that all the invocations to the API exposed by this microservice will be intercepted. This is what creates the slash hello entry point, which is the start span that is implemented using this function, hello. Also, you're going to notice that there are several invocations to this component called tracer to create the custom spans. So the first custom span is called build response, and the second one is the my span. This component tracer had been created programmatically as well. There was a function here on the bottom called init tracer that was called throughout the bootstrap of this microservice that not only creates, but also register the tracer within the context of the application. And this is what makes the tracer available to be used throughout the code so developers can create their own custom spans. 
This is what we mean by sometimes developers have to write custom code in order to achieve instrumentation using the white box instrumentation technique. Now let's take a look how black box instrumentation looks like. For this example, we're going to use a microservice written in Java. This microservice has the same business transaction as the microservice written in Go, a transaction called slash hello. You're going to notice that this transaction also has the same span generated. It all starts with an entry point called slash hello, and it contains the child spans called build response and my span. Now let's understand what is the difference between white box instrumentation and black box instrumentation. First of all, the Java platform allows the usage of something called an agent. An agent is a component that can be automatically change a code of a JVM in runtime without the developer have to write any code for it. And this is what we are doing here. We are downloading an agent from the OpenTelemetry project, and we are using that agent to execute the code provided by the developer. This is what allows the JVM to create and emit traces automatically without the developer have written a single line of code for it. However, if the developer choose to do so, they can also use tracers to create their own custom spans. The difference here is that they don't need to instantiate and register their own tracers. They can simply retrieve a tracer that has been instantiated and registered automatically by the agent and simply start using it right away. And since we're here, let's make a change in the code to see how the observability backend allow us to compare different releases of the code. In order to do this, we are going to create a new method that will create an artificial delay in the execution of the code. This new slow method is going to be responsible for pausing the execution of the code for five seconds. Then the next time we are going to actually execute this code, we're going to notice that the execution will not complete only after the five second has elapsed. And we are going to do use some annotations to make sure that a proper span from this method will be created. Now that we have changed the code, let's stop the execution of the microservice and execute it one more time so we can check the change. Now that the microservice is up and running, let's make an invocation to the endpoint so we can see the details of that execution in the observability backend. So as you can see here, we've executed the microservice and there is some delay in its execution. Although the result continues to be the same. Now let's go back to the observability backend and see how this new execution looks like. For this, I'm going to refresh to capture the last traces that has been received and stored in the observability backend. Now we can see that there are two traces. The first one is this that doesn't contain the very slow method execution. And we can also check that its execution was 173 milliseconds. Now, if we look to the second one, we're going to notice that not only it contains the very slow method that we've created in the code, but also the execution of this transaction also mimics what we've tried to achieve, which is creating some artificial slowness. This style of troubleshooting is very effective as long as the observability backend allows for longer retention periods to the ingested traces. Then you can compare current data with past data. With Elastic Observability, you can do this very easily with a few clicks. First, 
go to the stack management session in your Elastic Observability platform. Then find what is the data stream that is holding all your tracing data. Once you find it, click on it and then discover what is the index lifecycle policy or ILM that is associated to it. Once you find the ILM policy, you're going to be able to customize how the retention period for your data is going to behave. By default, all the data is stored on a hot phase. You can optionally customize some warm, cold, and frozen phases. And for each one of those phases, you can specify what is going to be the policy for retention. So in this case, I'm going to set in that any data after one year is going to end up on the frozen phase. The next step is going to add infrastructure to sustain each one of those phases. If you are running Elastic Observability with Elastic Cloud, this is very easily as well. All you got to do is go to your deployment, and then once you're there, you're going to click on Manage, Edit Deployment, and then you're going to scroll down and go to the sessions that has to do with the code and frozen tier. So in this example, I'm going to add capacity to the frozen tier and then once I submit the completion of this added, my infrastructure will be rebuilt and then I will be able to see all the data being automatically transferred between all this infrastructure without having to touch in anything related to infrastructure. I hope those two examples have helped you to understand how awesome distributed tracing can be. Now you know that you have the tools and the means to not only quickly find problems, but to truly understand what your code is doing in production. Now let's discuss something regarding how to use distributed tracing in the context of monitoring. Any person responsible for keeping systems online knows that they cannot do this without monitoring. Monitoring is the ability of continuously probe for the system's current state so they can use this information to assess if something is doing good or bad. Most of the time, any monitoring strategy starts off by collecting metrics for different parts of the application, such as databases, operating systems, load balancers, middlewares, uh, whatever other parts comprise the application. So there's not much of a criteria per se to be followed. However, it doesn't have to be like this. There are some lessons learned that you can use to implement a proper observability strategy when it comes to monitoring. One of them is called the four golden signals. The four golden signals comprise four key elements that you should pursue to make sure that you are going to the right direction. The first signal is called latency. and It's basically a measure of how fast or how slow the transaction is taking. The number of errors is something else, or maybe the number of problems that are, your application is generating, whether they are objective, like the number of HTTP errors, or subjective, like the number of uh, 200 response codes that came with errors. Traffic is something else entirely. Traffic is basically how much load your application is going through. And lastly, there is saturation. Saturation measure your system's ability to keep up with the pace and what's going to be the limit, the hypothetical limit where your application will stop serving requests. However, there's one important lesson to be considered regarding following blindly the four golden signals is that you cannot simply measure them as a way for you to prove that Oh, yeah, so this is not my fault if the application is not performing correctly, right? Because you cannot simply deliver software. You have to make sure that the software is doing what it's supposed to and making your customers happy. Otherwise, what is the point of what you're doing, right? A way and a strategy to actually ensure this is to use distributed tracing in conjunction with the measurement of the foregoing signals. So how this works, you are going to identify what are your main business transactions comprises, that comprises your application, and you are going to actually monitor those business transactions end-to-end -end using distributed tracing. Okay, but what has the four golden signals has to do about this? Well, 
there is a way for you to actually stitch the visualization and monitoring of your business transaction and all the foregoing signals that are derived from that business transaction. So what is the lesson here? Instead of just monitoring the foregoing signals individually, you have to monitor them from the perspective of the business transaction. And that's what's going to make sure that not only everybody responsible for the application will be always in the same page, but it will make sure that all the energy will be focused on what matters, which is ultimately customer satisfaction. We can call this the four golden signals in one perspective. There are different strategies that you can use to achieve this. It highly depends on number one, the ingestion strategies for the signal types such as traces and matrix. And number two, what type of observability backend you are using. To illustrate this, let's say, for example, that you're going to solve this problem by in the ingestion time. So when you collect the traces and you when you collect the matrix, you're going to leverage your ingestion tools to actually stitch them together and store them in the observability backend concurrently. So there you have it. They are correlated already. The other strategy is if your observability backend support this function, you can actually just send the traces and the matrix individually, and the observability backend is going to actually work for you to perform this correlation. Regardless, what you have to make sure is that you are going to unify them. So again, you are going to measure the four golden signals from the business transaction perspective. Hopefully now you have a pretty good idea about the value that distributed tracing can bring to your operations. With that said, let's discuss the role of distributed tracing in this new world of complex technologies. I mean, I am old enough to remember how things were way simpler when we used to have that load balancer that would serve all the requests coming from users, and that load balancer would basically distribute the load among different HTTP servers, uh, Apache HTTP server or IIS from Microsoft, right? So troubleshooting was all about tailing logs. I mean, we know the servers, we know by name, right? Because there, there are just a few of them behind a little balancer. And if I know where the logs reside, I can simply tailing them continuously and look for problems. And that life was easy, right? Uh, basically, the developer's job was to, okay, structure the log in their application and hard code the pieces of the code that should expose some information that would be useful during troubleshooting. So life was simple, right? Uh, that is when you would use strategies such what call follow the thread as troubleshooting style. So what is follow the thread? As I mentioned before, back then we used to have those HTTP servers such as Apache and basically each request coming from Apache, it would be served by a thread. So in other words, Apache would spin up a thread to serve that request. And essentially everything that would uh, execute within that thread, it would be like what your troubleshooting would should focus on. So tailing the log, look for the thread and everything that you need to know about that particular request was there. Then things started to be a little bit more complex when someone decided to distribute the load across multiple machines. So now, okay, the threads no longer resides in a single server. They might reside in different servers. So, all right, uh, that's a little bit harder, but still we're dealing with few servers. So I can always go to a specific servers, SSH to then, and then I could see the logs as I used to be. Okay, no big deal. So let's move forward. And then, people start realizing that, uh, okay, so they're, those hosts or servers, they're not being fully leveraged or utilized it. So there's a bunch of CPU and memory and disk that's not being fully utilized uh, on those hosts. So how do we maximize that utilization? So that's where the technology of virtualization came into play to so solve that problem of maximize the usage of uh, hardware and infrastructure. A good problem to solve and a good solution for it, but make the troubleshooter a little bit harder because now not only I have to SSH into the host, but in the VM of that host. So the troubleshooting becomes more complex. And then uh, another evolution step forward was the introduction of containers. So now 
the container is being executed within a VM and the VM is executed within a host and a host can be running on one or multiple data centers. So troubleshooting was no longer by far as simple as it used to be. So that is a proof that the technology is constantly changing and making, making the developer's life uh, much harder in terms of troubleshooting. So now uh, you might have heard that we are in the era of deploying code as a function uh, using serverless or function as a services technology available out there. And you can imagine now the complexity of troubleshoot and a, such a small unit of deployment. So uh, the TLDR here is that the word by far is not getting any simpler than that. Luckily for us, Distributed tracing can still be used here to make sure that you are going to see the business transaction uh, end to end in the observability backend. Regardless if your code is executed in a given host, uh, bare metal, or a VM, or a container, or maybe in a function is executed in a particular runtime. For this magic to happen, the distributed tracing technology has to make sure that something called the context is propagated throughout all the layers and traces generated through the lifetime of the business transaction. So here is how it works. In the beginning of your the business transaction, a context, which can be a number or an identifier, is created. And then throughout all the traces that are created subsequently uh, in, the, in the other invocations, this context has to be propagated throughout all the layers. This is how the observability backend can stitch all the traces and create a unified visualization of the whole business transaction for you automatically. So the trick here is to ensure the context is propagated throughout all the traces. That is very easy to achieve if you are dealing with a synchronous technologies such as microservices that uses REST HTTP requests or maybe gRPC requests. But we are living in the area of highly distributed and deep systems. And those technologies these days, they impose a different architecture style and design where all the services are decoupled by nature and they are executed in different times asynchronously. So here's the challenge, how the context can be propagated in a search architecture. So for example here, you have maybe a microservice written in Java that after reading uh, data some from a Radish database and serving the request to the user, he has to send a message to a topic uh, from Apache Pulsar, which is a messaging slash streaming technology. And then from the Java microservice perspective, that transaction finished. That's it. There's nothing else to do. But for the business transaction perspective, the transaction is still pending. Pending for what? for another microservice written in Go to read the message off Pulsar and continue the transaction and do something more with the information. So uh, the challenge here is how the context that has been originally created in the Java microservice will end up on the microservice written in Go. I'm gonna show you how to do this in the next demo. In this demo, I'm going to show you the example of a business transaction that comprises two different microservices, one written in Java called Brand Estimator, represented by the color green, and another one called Analytics Layer written in Go, represented by the color blue. In this timeline of events, you can see the details of this business transaction, which starts in the Java microservice through the start span called slash estimate. Within the context of that start span, different operations are executed, such as the reading of data from a Redis database, and then the last step is to send a message to Apache Pulsar in this span here called estimate send. We can see that this message has been sent to Pulsar by inspecting the metadata details of this span. So as you can see here, the action send was sent to the uh, messaging layer called Pulsar. As we mentioned before, from the Java microservice perspective, this transaction might have ended, but from the business transaction perspective, it's still pending. And it requires the microservice written in Go to read the message from Pulsar and continue the operation. And this is exactly what happened. So as you can see here, the estimates received span was still executed within the context of the same transaction. 
And you can see in the metadata details that what this operation did was to receive the message from Pulsar and continue the processing. Now let's take a look in the code that was required to make all of this happen. So in the Java microservice, you can see that it's been written using Spring Boot. So what we've done here is to inject this brand repository here in the Java object, which represents the interaction with the RAJ database. So after starting the entry point of this Java microservice API, which is this slash estimate entry point, we've performed some operation on Radis that basically means to retrieve some piece of data. The last step from the Java microservice is to feed the analytics layer. And we've done this by invoking the send method of the producer that was created and customized specifically to not only send the message to Pulsar, but to include the context within the message. This producer has been created and in order to make sure that we are going to customize the insertion of the context into the message, we've wrote a custom interceptor and associated to this producer. So if we take a look on this interceptor, you're going to see that this interceptor makes use of the open telemetry APIs. As you can see here, we've retrieved the global tracer that has been created and injected through the open telemetry agent. So another, in other words, this is another example of uh, black box instrumentation. And we've used the before send callback method to perform our custom instrumentation. So as you can see here, we've created a new span and we've said that this is a producer uh, and we've decorated this new span with some custom metadata so we can identify uh, things very easily in the observability backend. Then we've called the method store context on message that essentially what it does is to pick up the piece of context that has been captured from this Java microservice and we've managed to actually insert the context into the message as a proper. So from the Java microservice perspective, it has done its job to insert the context into the message. So it now it's up to the microservice written in Go to retrieve this concept, this context, and then continue the process. And let's take a look in the Go code and how this was done. So here you are looking to the for loop uh, in Go that we've created to actually process all the messages coming from Apache Pulsar. So besides the actual processing, we've actually did the job of using the open telemetry APIs to inject what we call a TextMac propagator and that does the job of extracting the current context that is inside the message, which in the open telemetry world, we call this the carrier, right? For this, we had to create a custom interface that knows how to retrieve messages, retrieve and write messages from the, uh, from the properties uh, of the message in Pulsar. And then once we've done this, we can actually use in the context of message processing, as you can see here. So after we extracted the context, we can create a custom span with the extracted context and then continue the processing. So as you can see here, the trick is literally to make sure that one layer puts the context in, inside the message or whatever other type of carrier that you are dealing with and the subsequent layers has to make sure to read that context off before in, uh, using and continuing any other context that you are doing this. If none of this code has been written, what would happen is that you would see two different transactions executing in different contexts and they, would, they wouldn't look like that they belong to the same business transaction. And for the, cert, for the sake of consistency in the observability backend, that would be considered a mistake. So, as you can see here, from the programming model and API's perspective, this is a Soviet problem of either open telemetry or other distributed tracing APIs provides you the tools for you to do that. However, the developer has to actually explicitly use that in their code to make that happen. The last thing that we are going to discuss here today is the practices that you can use to simplify your observability journey. So far, we've been discussing distributed tracing in the context of how to use it to build software reliability. In reality, most likely you are going to leverage distributed tracing 
along with other signal types, such as matrix and logs. You might have heard it on the internet, the concept of the three pillars of observability. And usually they refer to the signal types such as traces, matrix, and logs. But more importantly, they refer to the practice of establishing a set of processes, tools, and people dedicated to each one of those, let's call towers or pillars. This is wrong. The three pillars of observability are a fallacy. Um, why I don't believe in them? Because ultimately, they don't help with the ultimate goal of observability to help you to see the business transaction in a single cohesive and correlated view. Because you are now storing all the signal types in different platform or different backends that do not talk to each other. A better way to see observability is to unify all the signal types, either traces, matrix, log, or any other signal types that might come in the future in a single platform, specifically using a single data store that is capable of not only storing them, but correlating them in a such a way that you can view your business transaction and derive all the information regarding traces, logs, and metrics from them. Obviously, that requires the usage of a specific data store that is not very common out there. So, uh, in order to implement observability, you have to pick a data store capable of handling different signal types, such as traces, metrics, and logs. And this is not a very easy task, but you know what? You should not have to worry about this. Leave this problem to the observability vendors. They do this pretty well. Some of them might have used some technologies that are well known in the developer community, and some others might have written their own data store from scratch uh, along with their visualization tools. But for you, it doesn't matter. Just leave this problem to the observability vendors and make sure they support this concept of an integrated view of all the signal types. When it comes to distributed tracing specifically, another tip is for you to, as much as possible, to pick technologies that are based on open standards. So when it comes to tracing and matrix and in the future logs, there is open telemetry. Open telemetry is more than a technology, it is a set of specifications that dictate how you are going to capture, ingest, and store telemetry data. Because it's in the specification, you can have multiple implementations from different vendors and different technologies, but you are going to have the uh, assurance that your code that is based on open telemetry won't change if you decide for, for example, change from one observability vendor to another. That's the beauty of open telemetry, and that's why I like the most. I mentioned before that sometimes you have to use it open standard as much as possible because in my experience, there might be situations where uh, as much you would like to use open standards, you won't be able to. Because for example, a common problem is Maybe open telemetry is not available yet for a given programming language that uh, your development team uses to build your microservices and, or maybe the open telemetry is available for the programming language, but it's not mature yet or doesn't have a specific feature. So what you have to do is to uh, use a specific technology, uh, whatever it is, and make sure the telemetry data is going to be stored on the observability backend and hopefully uh, even though you are using a different technology, you will be able to correlate it along with your other signal types. A common complaint from the community regarding implement observability also has to do with uh, keep observability platforms up and running by themselves. That requires them to assimilate and observe a considerable amount of technologies and infrastructure and, as we discussed before, data store that, honestly, they shouldn't have to worry about that. So my advice for them is use something called observability as a service. There's a huge number of vendors out there that provide their observability platform as a service, meaning that you don't have to worry about the infrastructure that entails using that platform and you only pay for what you use. This is important because that creates a straight path for you 
to start using observability without worrying about what it takes to keep one platform up and running. A good example of observability as a service that you can use is Elastic Cloud. With Elastic Cloud, you can benefit from using Elastic Observability and not worrying with all the infrastructure details that you would have to undergo in order to start using the platform. Elastic Cloud can be deployed in different cloud providers, such as AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. By using the URL below, you can quickly create an account and start playing with Elastic Observability in a matter of minutes. You won't need a credit card for this. We provide you with a trial of 14 days where you won't have to pay anything for use the Elastic Observability deployments, as we call it, that you can create either in the web console or programmatically using Terraform. I know what you're thinking. Wow, that's a lot of information to digest. And you know what? You are not wrong. It is indeed. I would like to wrap up this session by mentioning that Software reliability is arguably one of the most important attributes of any given system. After all, a system that is not available or that users cannot use isn't that beneficial. There's a lot of ways for you to build software reliability, and as you have seen in this session, using distributed tracing helps a lot with this goal. I'd like to thank your participation and see you next time.